Welcome to the Vicarage Study once again. Study is an appropriate word because today I'm going to make you think. I'm making a talk out of an essay I wrote 22 years ago when I studied for my Bachelor of Divinity at Cardiff University. I'm sure more theology has been written on the subject of the problem of evil and suffering since then. I've changed it to be more personal and relevant to our present time and I'm also including some of my own artwork. So why is there a problem with evil? Religions that believe in one God and believe that God is good and all-powerful, that is, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, are challenged by the problem of evil and suffering. There seems to be a logical problem with the belief that, on the one hand, God exists and is all-powerful, that is, omnipotent, and knows everything, that is, omniscient, and on the other hand, that God is good. Some of the earlier ways developed to solve the problem of good and evil are, well, actually, four classical theological approaches. The first is to say that evil doesn't really exist. This is perhaps rather difficult for us to understand in the 21st century, but it goes like this. God is ultimate perfection and true reality. Beneath God, there's a hierarchy of lesser perfection, descending into the totally imperfection, which is non-being. God is perfectly good, so it follows that evil is total imperfection. Or to put it another way, evil doesn't really exist, nor the suffering that comes with it. This view is very counterintuitive and needs a view of perfection that doesn't make sense to us today. In fact, it's so far from the way we think today, it's difficult to understand. And we might say, if my mortal mind thinks I'm miserable, then I am miserable. And it's not an illusion that I'm miserable. The second way of getting round the problem is to deny that God is omnipotent. God is engaged in a struggle with Satan to overcome evil. And I want to share with you this picture of St Michael casting out Satan from heaven that I painted some years ago. The problem with this idea is that it needs two principles of absolute reality when you can only have one absolute reality or the reality isn't absolute. The idea of Satan or fallen angels is also of little use because it begs the question why did God create angelic beings that could fall? Some thinkers have tried to get around this problem by saying God is in the process of overcoming disorder. But that leaves us with the problem of why there is disorder in the first place. This idea reminds us of a Gnostic heresy, that there is an evil creation that is at odds with God. Behind me is a painting of the creation of the universe, the Big Bang. I call this Logos, or Word, from In the Beginning was the Word. Some people might want to claim that God is the despot, to use the Greek word despotes, that is, the ultimate ruler of the universe. And it is for God to choose what happens to every living thing. God's will is always right. This idea does have some biblical backing. For example, in the picture of the potter and clay. And it's a view that was held by Calvin and Bart in the 20th century. But we should remember that the actual main view of kingship in the Old Testament is not despotism. It's based on God's righteousness. Really, this idea of despotism is another way of trying to say evil doesn't really exist. Despotism stresses God's power at the expense of God's fatherhood and love. 
God is all-powerful, but God isn't loving. Many people who suffer find this idea offensive. To the modern mind, it condemns God as evil. Then there is what we call the moral theory. This approach proposes that God is limited by God's own character of righteousness, truth and love. There are various ways of using this idea, for example, that God created the best possible world and that a world that contained less evil in some way is not as good. And then there's what we call the free will defence. God cannot do things that are irrational or morally wrong. Just as two and two can never make five, you and I cannot be both free and, at the same time, be forced to do good. In our current situation, some people have said that human destruction of nature is what caused coronavirus to jump from an animal disease to a human disease. God couldn't put a stop to it because it was an, an inevitable consequence of our actions. We could also say today's fast travel by aeroplanes has led to the rapid spread of disease, the same transport that contributes to global warming. This way of thinking is not saying that either coronavirus or global warming is a punishment for our sins, but that they become about because of the way we live today. That of course may well be true, but many people will suffer who are not responsible for the destruction of the environment or globalisation. It doesn't speak to those of us who are suffering through no fault of our own. Jesus himself said, Are those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? The problem with all these ideas is that God is still responsible for evil because God chose to create this world of suffering. In contrast, a number of 20th century theologians, such as Maltman, Fides and Hick, have tried to understand how evil can coexist with the idea of God without having to justify God's actions. For Maltman, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is the centre of all Christian theology. Through the cross, God enters into the problems of suffering of the world and answers them. Maltman argues that this idea of an unmoved God leads us to the conclusion that God is a capricious demon. In the light of the Somme, Auschwitz, Hiroshima, Vietnam and today's human rights abuses, it is easier to believe in the devil than in God. Far from seeing the absolute as good and evil as non-being, the absolute seems to be evil and good is a shadow absence of evil. Maltman argues that a God who cannot suffer is inferior to a suffering humanity because humanity has a capacity to suffer which God cannot grasp. An all-powerful God is an incomplete being because a God like that can't experience the helplessness or powerlessness of our humanity. If we start our understanding with the cross, our view of God and of evil is transformed. God enters into the suffering world and swallows up death and evil. Evil can now be seen as anything that limits humanity and a nothingness which consumes humanity. It is not the non-being of classic thought, but an active and hostile non-being. It is an annihilating whirlpool into which existing things are sucked and which drains them of the potential by which they exist. If God's suffering is to be helpful to the victims of evil, two conditions need to, to be fulfilled. First, God must be ultimately victorious and so give hope to all who suffer. And second, God must suffer with each of us, 
not just in the example of Jesus on the cross. If God suffers, God is a victim of evil and not a capricious torturer of creation. If God is a victim of evil, God should not be seen as the directly responsible for suffering in any way, not even as a disciplinarian. God is not an all-powerful game player who moves pieces about the chessboard. Yet God might still be considered to be indirectly responsible for evil and our suffering by permitting suffering where it could be prevented. To put it another way, we must find a way of understanding why the world is as it is and why God might allow suffering. For God to create a world in which suffering is a possibility makes God responsible if even evil and suffering occurs. So let's go back and look at free will again. Hick recognises that Christ's suffering gives us some help. For many of us Christians, this idea, coupled with our own religious experience, effectively overcome the challenge of evil. Even so, Hick wants to develop a better understanding of evil that answers the problem that God is still responsible for suffering and evil in the world. So let's go back to the idea of original sin. First, Hick rejects the idea that all the problems started with Adam and Eve. That doesn't explain evils like earthquakes, hurricanes and other natural disasters. Nor does Hick feel it's reasonable for a wholly good world to become evil as a punishment for the first humans. Hick puts up the idea of the world as a veil of soul making that originated with Irenaeus in the very early church. Humans are made in the image of God, but we're not the finished article. We have to transcend the image of God to become the likeness of God. The first stage of this process was the physical evolution of humanity. The second stage is our formation of God's likeness. This can't be done for us by an all-powerful God because it needs a free response by us, by humanity, to God. Hick believes that God is justified in allowing evil to be part of this slow building up of the goodness of individuals. The value of the world is not its ability to give us pleasure or pain, but as a place for making our souls. Any world that did not contain e evil would make us humans into God's pets and not transform us into children of God. Flo and Mackey disagreed with this idea. They thought that it was possible for God to create a world where there's no evil and everyone turns towards God, but where humans are free to make choices at all stages. Humans could be free, but always choose God. Hick argued back that they don't have a strong enough view of freedom. Nothing can be predetermined. The situation must have an element of predictability, rather in the way that mathematicians use ideas like chaos to describe this sort of unpredictability. In this idea of freedom, it's almost inevitable that we will sin. Hick then goes on to argue that given such freedoms, we must all be created at a distance from God, because any rational being living close to God would never fall because a fall is irrational. That is, of course, assuming that we're rational beings. Evolution has produced precisely the distance between God and us that's needed. It also produces a world where the Creator can be seen by faith but not proven by logic. Evil, though, 
Evil, though a necessary part of this world, is not something that's of value in itself. It is only valuable as something to be overcome. If actions could never cause harm, there'd be no possibility of doing good or bad actions. But why so much evil? Could not Hiroshima have been avoided? He argues that there are no absolute in, in evil and that we could only ask the same question of a lesser evil such as the destruction of Rotterdam if Hiroshima was removed. But what about those of us who suffer and are never redeemed? Hick agrees that this would count against his views but he believed that in the end all humans are destined to be redeemed. When all of these arguments have been made, we can't get away from the idea that God is responsible for evil and suffering. Suffering is a necessary part of God's plan to form souls. Is making of souls worth the suffering? Like Ivan in Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov, we could feel that it would be better to hand back the entrance ticket because the price is too steep. Hick returns to the cross at this point. Jesus harmonises God's sovereignty with God's love and God's struggle with evil in the cross and resurrection. Christ takes the reality of our existence and our struggle with evil into God so that the living faith makes evil disappear. This does not mean the Holocaust is nothing, it remains evil and works against God. Yet in the end, God's good purpose for each of us who suffer will not be defeated. And so, to wrap everything up, Hick's arguments are attractive to many, but have been criticised for seeming to give evil a dignity of having a role in God's purposes. In the end, evil remains a mystery that we can seek to understand, but never quite manage to explain. I believe that for the Christian, and for myself, Maltman's approach is better than any theological theories because it provides a way to live with the mystery of evil and suffering. However, if we accept that God has taken the problem of evil on God's self through the cross, it's possible to revisit the classical ideas and see them as possible explanations of evil. If God has taken our suffering into God's self, then we can believe that e evil might amount to nothing in the end. This doesn't have to be offensive to those who suffer because God is suffering with each of us, feeling our suffering as we feel it. The picture of God as a despot might also be purified from its offensiveness because we do not have the knowledge to allow us to judge God's purposes. God is not just the potter that shapes the clay of humanity, but God is also within and inside the clay and feels it being moulded. The cost of freedom might not be too great because God is paying the price both by suffering with us and by suffering on the cross. There are also aspects of the dualism, God and evil, and that struggle that culminates in the cross. The dualism is only in the context of this life. From the external perspective, from outside, there is only one absolute, the good, loving, omnipotent God. Now, when Akulia, my second son, Abhidaniel, died, 
It was these ideas that helped me to keep faith and accept the mystery of evil and suffering because my view of the world was centred on the incarnation, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Perhaps it might also help you to keep faith at this time of global pandemic, the shutdown of our country and the suffering we and those around us experience. So, I hope you found this reflection of mine updated on suffering and evil helpful. Let us pray. Lord God, give us faith. Help us not to lose our faith at this time when so many are suffering, but to submit all to you. We pray for those who are ill with COVID-19, but we remember that there are many other people suffering in the world for many other reasons, from hunger, from moving from their land and their home as refugees, from natural disasters, from oppression and persecution. Lord, help us to keep our faith, but also help us to play our part in bringing about a better world. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered and died on the cross, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen.